I'm sure you guys are well aware that me and Danny are absolute dynasty trading degenerates. So what we decided to do in this video is break down all of the dynasty fantasy football trades that we've made throughout this season. And we're going to go through and kind of grade each other's trades basically and talk about, you know, our strategy behind why we were trading for specific players and, you know, the team context of, you know, I'm a contender, I needed this, or I'm a rebuilder and I'm looking to do this. So this should be a fun exercise. Of course, you know, feel free to leave any trade grades down below in the comments. If you think we got raked over the coals in some of these trades, or if you think a lot of these trades were savvy moves, we'd love to hear from you down there. Um, and of course, if you guys want to send us any trades, feel free to reach out to us at any point in time. We do cover five dynasty trades every week on our Monday morning live stream. So uh, before we get into this video, Danny, how you doing? Doing well, doing well. And yeah, this is just a different type of video we've been doing. Obviously, you know, it's been a lot of uh, waiver wire and start sets, you know, this and that. It's just fun kind of breaking down our dynasty teams because you guys kind of wondering, well, how are your dynasty teams doing? Like what type of activity have you guys been doing? Like how, if you're a contender, like what type of moves are you making? If you're a rebuilder, what type of moves have you been making? And a lot of those questions are going to be answered in today's video. So if you guys enjoy it, like we always say, make sure you leave a like down below, comment down below some of your biggest dynasty trades. And of course, if you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. We are on the road to 40,000. So let's always no more time and let's get right into it. All right, so the structure of today's video is going to be, since me and Danny are in a bunch of Dynasty Leagues together, we figured we would break this up for ease sake and, you know, group the Dynasty Leagues that we're in together and talk about what trades we've made in those leagues. So to start things off, we're going to break down, I have four trades and Danny has three trades from leagues that we are not in together. So leagues that we, you know, don't each have a team in. And then after we're done going through those trades, those seven trades, we'll go through the leagues that we are in the same league together. So I'll get us kicked off here with uh, the Get Faded League. So the um, format of this league is like a half PPR, 12 team, super flex. My team is a competitive team. Uh, I have, you know, Bijan and a bunch of other guys that are in a competitive window. And September 26th is when I made this trade. The reason I made this trade was because I had JK Dobbins as my RB2 and I had a couple other guys that suffered some injuries. So what I was looking to do was go out and acquire, you know, a young running back that was able to kind of you know, boy up my offense and kind of uh, give me a solidified RB2 because my receiver core is loaded. I have George Kittle as my tight end and a tight end premium. My uh, my quarterbacks are Justin Herbert, Kirk Cousins, and Bryce Young, so I'm pretty strong at that position as well. So the trade I made was I sent away Elijah Moore and my own 2024 second, which projects to be mid to late because I am a competitive team, probably a top three to, uh, three to four team in the league. And I, tra uh, I acquired James Cook for that trade. So what are your thoughts, uh, Danny, on acquiring James Cook for essentially, you know, a late second and Elijah Moore. So right off the bat, because of the situation you're in as a competing team, trying to buy some running back points, you already know from like a pure value standpoint, like you're probably going to have to overpay a little bit. So although on a face value standpoint, I probably would take the two and Elijah Moore, given the context of your team, knowing that Elijah Moore, as much as we like him, like right now, realistically, isn't a big needle mover from a production standpoint. And James Cook, given the running back landscape, is probably going to give you top 15 production rest of the year. I actually like this move. Now, it kind of sucks. You know, you kind of have to pay up the barrel here. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, I think, like we know, James Cook uh, insulated to a good offense. Obviously, the role that he has with Buffalo, high in RB2 level expectation. If you have a contending team, knowing how we structure these rosters, built around your quarterbacks, built around your wide receivers, you know, you have needle movers everywhere else. I don't mind, like I mentioned, getting the point production here. So if I were to grade this, I'd probably say about a B is where I'd land on it. Maybe yeah, that was that was kind of how I felt about it at the time. I could have gone a little bit more for like a win now running back. But again, like that comes with a lot of risk because one of the guys that I maybe could have traded for was, you know, somebody like Nick Chubb who would have gotten yeah. injured or something like, you know what I mean? So at least with James Cook, even though he's not giving me like needle moving RB1, mid RB1 production, like maybe a Tony Pollard would have. At least this way, I have some flexibility where I can stay as a multi-year contender, still get a pretty solid trade done, get myself a solid asset and not give up too much as far as future is concerned, because my team is well set up to compete for multiple years, not just this year, because I am, I'm just coming off the backs of a rebuild. So getting James Cook, a guy that should be relevant for, you know, next two to three years on his rookie contract was a little bit more appealing to me than going after like Austin Eckler or Tony Pollard or something like that. 
Yeah, no, I, I like the rationale and I like the move that you made. So uh, we can move on to my first deal. And this is actually from the Laster League Best Ball League that uh, we ended up making both the Laster and the Bush League last year. I'm sure you got a trade to cover with the Bush League one. But in this league, 12 team PPR, 0.5 tight end premium, six point pass and touchdown. Like I mentioned, Best Ball League. I'm a competing team. I had four 2024 20, ones entering the year with a competitive roster. So you can imagine just how good that thing looks now because I ended up shipping what ended up being two of those ones, two teams that are trying to compete for the first overall pick so although they both say early to mid one it's pretty likely that at least one of them's more so going to be in the mid-range considering the fact that they're just trying to sell off raft assets and compete with each other so these two moves in conjunction end up uh, materializing into jared goff two early to mid first round picks sam laporta and a third and end up getting a ton of win now help to help me justin fields amari cooper javante williams Mark Andrews, AJ Brown, Terry McLaurin, Najee Harris. Now in a lineup format, maybe you don't go for, you know, seven pieces that can help your lineup, but because it's a best ball, I just want bodies that have high end weekly ceilings any given week. Uh, and I will acknowledge that this first deal, I probably lost looking back. Now I made this move after week one, Justin Fields, obviously all off season was still a first round startup pick. So I thought I was honestly getting a steal. Jared Goff, a first and a second for Justin Fields uh, and Amari Cooper set, uh, felt pretty fair to me. And the fact that I got Javante on the side was an added bonus. But now looking back on it, Justin Fields, long-term question marks. I don't really know what's going to go on there. Jared Goff, of course, on the other side, been playing some of his best football. And that first-round pick is probably going to be early. So like I said, from a pure value standpoint, I don't like where it materializes. But the reason why I kind of want to include this one is I still like the process here. Like I'm a 7-0 best ball team. I'm one of the best teams in the league. Yeah, I've kind of not worked out from a value standpoint, but at the same time, I have seven needle moving assets that can help me win any single matchup. And for a league that I'm trying to win this year, that's going to help me more than just stacking the value of two first when I still have two in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. Having two first definitely still helps you. And also, I mean, Justin Fields has been like your prototype best ball uh, yeah. dynasty quarterback right now. Cause he's either giving you monster games or he's not giving you anything. I mean, it kind of sucks that, you know, Javante Williams and you know Terry McLaurin and Najee Harris and some of these assets haven't quite given you the necessary point production you were searching out for. But I mean, AJ Brown's been awesome. Mark Andrews yeah. has been really good. Justin Fields from a best ball standpoint has been pretty solid. And I think better days are ahead for Amari Cooper, for Javante Williams and some of the other assets there. I would say that first deal, probably like a C. I, I don't like, even I at the time, I was a little worried about Justin Fields. So I probably wouldn't have been, you know, jumping the gun to go out and sell assets for the guy. And uh, the second deal, I mean, giving up Sam Laporta really, really sucks because of, you know, what's transpired yeah. uh, where that Sam Laporta and Mark, Mark Andrews from a production standpoint and a long-term dynasty standpoint are relatively comparable now. And the early to mid ones that you gave up basically. And again, even if one of those is mid and one of those is early, those assets definitely hurt to lose for sure. For but sure. um, generally speaking, I mean, you can't really complain when you're seven and oh. And that's why I want to include it in the video, because at the end of the day, like we're going to talk about deals that we've won in the past, but we got to be fully transparent. And I do think that from a pure value sample, like you said, C is probably a fair, uh, fair grade for that first deal in particular. Yeah, for sure. So um, another two trades that I made here in uh, the Bitcoin league. So this league, uh, we actually put the money into Bitcoin. So basically the pot is determined by how good Bitcoin is doing. Um, house money team. So this is a team that, you know, I'm coming off of a rebuild. My team's starting to turn the corner. I decided to make a move to, um, you know, be a little bit more aggressive and try and win because there's only like two really good teams in this league and nobody else is competing. Like literally everybody else in the league is like, selling off their pieces. They're like, does anybody have picks? I'm trying to sell these players. So nobody's trying to compete in this league. And again, we want to embrace the variance of fantasy football. So even though I would say I'm comfortably the third best team in this league, anything can happen, right? So the fact that my team was already well set up, I had picks, I had players, I had uh, you know a developing roster. So I went out and I made a couple moves here. I didn't have a tight end to speak of on this roster. So I traded Sky Moore in my own 2024 second, which I project to be mid to late for David and Joku in a third. This is a super flex PPR half point tight end premium. So, uh, you know, David and Joku, probably not the most valuable tight end in the world, but he is giving you some decent production. He's definitely an upgrade to what I had before. Um, I am, I had Logan Thomas basically as my only other rosterable tight end from like a redraft standpoint. So not a bad move there. I don't think it's like an A plus move by any means but I did, you know, really need a tight end to help myself compete. Yep. The other move I made on September 16th. So about a week before the previous move that I just talked about, I traded away Quentin Johnston, which is looking like a fucking smart move right now, given yeah. how Quentin Johnston has performed. 
and uh, a 2024 late first. Again, it is is my first, so it'll probably be mid to late. And then uh, an early second, so not my own second. And I got Travis Etienne was the crown jewel I was going after, who I would say his dynasty value has since appreciated because he's been very good from a production standpoint. I got the 301 guaranteed. This guy's literally like 0-7 right now, and his team is terrible. And then uh, Miles Sanders was just a throw-in. I didn't really want Miles Sanders. I, I think he had another win now running back I was after. But he's like, I'll give you Miles Sanders. And I was like, sure, whatever. Like, Miles Sanders, not the most exciting asset in the world. The, the, the deal that I wanted here was basically the first and Quentin Johnston for ETN, which I would have honestly done straight up. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I will say uh, at the time that it was made, you can say, okay, was this the process move first round wide receiver? But obviously, I mean, it's aged like fine wine. Travis Etienne is literally one of the needle uh, needle moving running backs in fantasy. You could say he's a locked in top fan, a top five fantasy running back rest of the season. And obviously, with uh, Quentin Johnson, uh, that hasn't really been the case uh, to say the least. So uh, the September sixteenth move, move in particular, obviously, has worked out very well. Looking back on it with hindsight in mind. It's obviously got to be an A plus given the fact that you're trying to win and you got a running back that can give you top five production that's still only 24 years old. And then the other deal, uh, obviously at the time, Sky Moore, a lot of the hype. Uh, two weeks, I believe this was probably going into week three, September 22nd. Yeah. So I think Sky Moore had like donutted the first game. And then the second game, he showed, I think he scored a touchdown in the second game and he showed a little bit of signs of life. But I wasn't really convinced that he was yeah. going to do much of anything. And I, I have a loaded wide receiver core in this league. I have Justin Jefferson, Drake London, Jordan Addison, um, Brandon Ayuk. Like my team, my receiver core is absolutely loaded. So Sky Moore doesn't really yeah. needle at all for me in that, in that core. Yeah, I mean, I think you'd say at this point that it's probably about fair value, uh, but given the context of your team, like you said, 0.25, or 0.5, sorry, tight end premium, uh, house money with the opportunity to potentially be top three. Yeah, I, I, and I'm I like five that. and two now after this week, yeah. so I'm in a position. I'm in third place right now. I'm in a position to make the playoffs, and ETN has been a big reason for that. So, yep. No, I, I like the move overall, though. Uh, I think both are really good moves uh, and help further the goal, like you said, that you kind of planted out going into the year. Um, my next trade actually is going to come from the Mickey Mouse League. So, uh, for context, it's a league with a lot of the analysts like Dynasty IM, uh, Jacob Sanderson, Ron Stewart, a lot of uh, Akash uh, from uh, Wiser Fantasy, a lot like a lot of the guys that you'd see on Twitter are in this league. And for context with this team, again, I'm not usually one to trade elite quarterbacks, but this league, in terms of the competition, is just so top heavy. Everybody is just going at bat with each other. There's about three total tanking teams right now. And all of our teams are very, very bad because I'm one of those three teams. So for context here, again, I'm in a, th a clear bottom three tank battle. Uh, two or three of us are all battling for Drake May, for Caleb Williams, because we want the quarterbacks uh, given the league context. So I had to further my chances. Again, 11 ones in the next two years, 13 in the next three. I end up making a couple huge moves. So this first one in particular, September 15th, 2023, I'm kind of regretting looking back on the reason being why I'm kind of regretting is that at the time Ian was more so a mid projected one, but when he asked for his pick back, I'm like, okay, I got to make sure I get some juice on this in case he tries to out tank me. I end up getting Garrett Wilson for his pick back. Like I said, it's probably a mid projected pick in my own hands, but knowing the fact that if he had sold Garrett Wilson for his one, he would probably end up tanking. I should have considered that a little bit more, but you guys see it end up getting Garrett Wilson. That pick now is, uh, Probably going to project pretty favorably, so I'd say I lost that deal. However, again, Garrett Wilson, it probably could have been the 104-105 in my own hand, so I don't mind making that move. Next deal, right after making that Garrett Wilson move, I'm like, okay, I'm a rebuilding team still. I gave up one first. What is my next immediate mind to do? Let me try and gather picks back. I end up sh uh, shipping Brandon Ayuk to like a middling type of contender for a future first, second, and third, which I will take all day. I think right now he is... like fourth or fifth in the league. So uh, if that ends up being mid, I would take that pick straight up over Ayuk. And the fact that I got the second and third there, nice process move, shed some points. Don't really have to speak much more on it. And then the final deal is the big, big one that I wanted to include. Again, I don't like shipping elite quarterbacks, but anytime I can get what I view almost five ones of value, especially in the spot, knowing Josh Allen's giving me 25, 28 points per game rest of the season. And that the margins between picking first and picking fourth in this league are like that. That was my motivation to make this move. Now, doesn't feel good trading Josh Allen in this package, but at the same time, 3-1, Stack Prescott, who I bought off a low after that San Francisco 49ers game, I know given the league context, I'm going to be able to get more value later on. It's tough. I don't like... 
a lot of these deals. I'm like, sure. I'll, I'll give you the, the Garrett Wilson one. You know, you're buying Garrett Wilson, selling yep. it for a mid projected one. That's not bad. I really don't like the Ayuk deal, to be really? honest. I think Ayuk is worth more than one first at this point in time, probably a first and a second. And if that first is going to a contender, I, I really like Ayuk rest of the season to help that contender out. So even if they just barely squeak into the playoffs and that pick is 107 or 108, for reference, I, dude, Brandon Ayuk is is a stud, man. I, I think he should probably be like the 104, 105 in terms of 2024 first value. So for me, I actually prefer the Ayuk side. And I don't blame you for this move, you know, totally, because I think Ayuk is, you know, getting th three picks, one, a two, and a three is not bad. I just personally would rather have Ayuk. Uh, for reference, I'm just checking the standings right now. So he is currently in eighth place at three and three with the fifth least point uh, uh, potential point. So that's actually an okay, earlier. So if that pick ends up being, you know, 104, 105, I think that's probably a fine move then. Because like, I, I really do value IU quite, quite high. Like, I think he's like a, a sure. wide receiver one in Dynasty, to be honest. Like, I think he, yeah. he should warrant, you know, a mid first and a mid second plus, to be honest, in on the open market. And I think I would have preferred this deal if you had gotten a one and two twos rather than a one, a two and a three, um, yeah. which is basically kind of how I value Ayuk. I, I really do not like the Josh Allen move. Really, I really yeah. don't like it, to be honest. I think Dak Prescott is, I know you're a Cowboys fan and you love yourself some Dak. He is not a needle moving quarterback at all in dynasty because he's too old to, uh, to fetch anything great on the open market. His offensive scheme and his offensive coordinator are not allowing him to at least like throw, throw, throw like they were in recent years. So what you just traded for, in my opinion, is like Kirk Cousins and two and three ones, which Josh Allen, I need an overpay. This is not an overpay in my yeah. opinion. If this was Kyler Murray, two ones and a 2026 one, I think that's probably See? a little bit more fair. But to be honest, I still might take Josh Allen. Uh, th that's the disconnect here. I, again, I'm higher on Dak than you are. That's really just the big, can you agree here. that the open market value of Dak is never going to get better though? At least, I mean, it's already gotten better since I made this trade for the record slightly, but I, I will say like, nobody's I, giving up two ones of value for Dak Prescott. Like maybe you value him that highly, but I guarantee I, you would not get that, that on the open. I have, market. I have him appropriated about a, a one and a half in this deal, which is about four and a half. Is what I right, got. which I need more than that for Josh Allen. Sure. Josh Allen to me is too much of a needle mover to give him up for what he's market value worth. And I really like Josh sure. Downs too. And he doesn't, he's not really a huge part of this deal, but I, I, I still like him. Fair. Uh, keep in mind too, the mid to late is uh, again, six or seven guys that are competing for the championship. So that could go anywhere from like 106 to 111. So that's fair. I, I, I just personally, yeah. I would have wanted more for Allen. I would have yeah. wanted a better no, asset, right. less assets, but a better one is probably what yeah. I would have wanted. If this was Kyler Murray yeah. and two first instead of Dak yeah. Prescott and three, I almost would have preferred that to be honest. Fair. Yeah. No, again, I I'm just being open here. Uh, that's what I thought was appropriate. Uh, again, I think Dak Prescott obviously is deflated in value right now, but knowing the context of the league, uh, I, I can get the draft capital if I need to. That's fair. The way the last thing I'll say about it is that I don't see a difference between Jared Goff and Dak Prescott, to be honest. I think they're That's probably hyperbolic. similar from a dynasty perspective. And I know you disagree with that, yeah. but honestly, I feel like most people in most league markets are probably on my side of that. I don't know, man. I'm not giving up on the quarterback. That was a second round startup pick this year. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so we can move on to another trade here that I made in the Bush League best ball league. So we talked about yours in the Ladster best ball league. This was the equivalent thing that I made. Um, this is a league where I would say probably one of my best dynasty teams overall. Um, it was a house money team coming into the year. I didn't really have any running back production or so I thought. But then Kyron Williams decided to come out of the woodwork. Zach Moss decided to come out of the woodworks. Um, Rashad white decided to be pretty decent from a best ball standpoint. So my team had actually been overperforming to this September 20th date when I made this trade. So I actually had like, you know, Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson and DK Metcalf and all these great wide receivers, my quarterback course, Anthony Richardson, Deshaun Watson, um, Kyler Murray, who's coming back soon, Ryan Tannehill, Mac Jones. So in a best ball format, I had a really strong quarterback core, really strong wide receiver core. My rookie tight end, Sam Laporta, absolutely balling this year. Pat Fryermuth and Jake Ferguson, my tight end depth, also contributing from a best ball standpoint. So what I decided to do was go out and get what I consider to be a needle moving running back a guy that's not going to lose a lot of value long-term who can still give me good production this year, which is the type of running back trade targets I want to go after if I'm a contending team. So I went out and I basically sold a first straight up for Kenneth Walker. That first, since I traded the pick, has gotten a little bit better. I will say it looked like it was going to be, you know, a mid to late first when I traded it. And it's probably more so 105 to 108 now, which is a little bit sketchy. But I will yeah. say Kenneth Walker has also gotten a lot better as well since I traded for him. 
Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, this is about equivalent value, I would say. But like you kind of mentioned, knowing the context of your team, you're trying to compete. Uh, Kenneth Walker still a young running back, still a top five or so uh, dynasty running back, give or take, five to eight range. I honest to God, I think Kenneth Walker solidified as a top five dynasty running back. Really? At this point. Yeah. Fair um, yeah, he's been unbelievable so far this year. And but, like, like I'm worried about Charbonnet to some degree, but honestly, like, like it hasn't really mattered to this point in the season. And, you know, the thing that matters again is my team is five and two and I have the second yeah. most points for in the league. And yeah. the guy who's first I traded away, like, yeah, he's in seventh place right now. And he, you know, doesn't have a ton of points for, but I, he also is on a three losing streak. Like he was two and one when I made this trade. Yeah, no, for sure. And knowing the context of the time and knowing the context that he adds you points. I'm not going to argue with that deal. I think it was a good trade in your. Yeah, yeah, he also, I mean, this week he lost. He had bipocalypse and he's had some injuries here and there. His team should probably be closer to middle yeah. of the pack by the time the season is done. And also, similar to your point, I still have three ones next year. Yeah. So I, I still have a lot of picks in this draft and my team is pretty complete already. So um, I could still stand to maybe make another move to go after a win now asset or just kind of ride this house money out and see kind of what happens and then reload again next year to be a true, true, like, you know, contender in this league. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, I like that. Um, the final league that I'm going to talk about that we're not both in together is actually from uh, 905 Dynasty. So context here, 10 team PPR Superflex League, four point passing touchdown with a 0.5 tight end premium. And in terms of my team right now, I am like the number one tanking team. I have the 2024 101 basically locked in right now at this current point. I'm going to get Caleb Williams, but outside of Caleb Williams, like I'm either old because the only quarterback I have right now starting on my roster is Dak Prescott. Or I just don't have other options because, like I said, the only quarterback I have in my roster is Dak Prescott. So uh, knowing that that's a case and knowing that I am extremely strong at wide receiver, Chris Olave, Devontae Smith, DJ Moore, Calvin Ridley, like a lot of a lot of wide receiver names already on this roster. So I end up swinging two of them to go get a needle mover at quarterback. I end up swinging, swinging Drake London and Jordan Addison in exchange for Anthony Richardson. Uh, the other guy had, I think, uh, Bryce Young, Anthony Richardson, Trevor Lawrence, and like Justin Herbert or something. So he was set a quarterback. So it was just kind of perfect marriage here. He needed to get rid of a quarterback. I needed to acquire a quarterback, and he needed wide receiver talent, which I had an abundance of. Yeah, I think at face value, I like the move. Like Drake London and Jordan Addison, we're talking probably third round startup picks, give or take, uh, maybe fourth yep. round startup picks for a guy that will be a top 10 to 15 startup yep. pick at the very least in Anthony Richardson. So I like the move from that perspective strategically, I, I mean, if you're contending for the one-on-one, I actually really like holding Drake London and Jordan Addison. And maybe you said the guy had Bryce Young as well. I might've gone after the cheaper alternative in Bryce Young instead of going after Anthony Richardson. Maybe it only costs you one of these guys to get to all the way up to Bryce Young. So that would be the only thing that I would have maybe done differently, but I can't fault you for getting a, a needle moving quarterback. Well, one of the main things here is that Anthony Richardson is going to be out for the year as well. So right, yeah. So I'm a, you you made this yeah. trade recently, which means yeah. that Anthony Richardson was already out when you made the trade. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which obviously tanks your own pick and secures that one on one um for you. So yeah, I mean, strategically it's probably a good move. I, I I will say, like, if you could have possibly used some of the aging wide receivers or Dak to make this move done. Would have loved to. Yeah, would've, and would've, I'm sure maybe it wasn't possible. They wanted young players yeah. as well as people usually do in Dynasty. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, my final two trades, and we can just go rapid fire on these ones, and then we'll get into some of the leagues that we're actually in together and some of the trades we've made in those leagues, just some process trades. So uh, for those of you guys out there wondering what you should do when you have a tanking team, this is it. So I, yeah. in this tanking team, I'm like full out tanking. I'm 0 and 12 right now. Like I have the one one pretty much lock stock and barrel, like uh, in this can't wait league is the league that I'm in right now. So uh, it's a league median. That's why I'm 0 and 12 yeah. uh, currently right now. So I sell off Josh Kelly in a late third, not my own third, for a random 2025 second, which, again, Josh Kelly, roster clogger. Like, I get him off my roster, and I get a third to a second, basically. Great process move, in my opinion. A.J. Dillon, kind of the same thing. At this point in time, September 20th, Austin Eckler was injured. Aaron Jones was injured. So I sell off the two handcuffs, Josh Kelly and A.J. Dillon, and I net two second-round picks, basically, out of it. Yeah, no, I process move like you kind of said there's not really much else to uh, analyze here other than that these are the moves that you have to make like if you are not competing in your dynasty league and you have aj Dillon, josh kelly alexander madison coming into the air like those types of running backs man like they are production piece they are not value accrual pieces like even if for example they peak and they're like kyron williams like was anybody actually giving you a first round pick for kyron williams at some point 
right? Yeah, I mean, some people were. I will well, say, that's what like, I mean, we're like, it, cover one deal where I probably did get one uh, for Kyron Williams. Wow. But um, yeah, I mean, AJ Dillon and Josh Kelly types accomplishes two goals. One, it gets those production pieces off your team, yeah. so you don't fall ass backwards into the 103 instead of the 101. And two, you you get second round picks, which is usually always a good re-roll when we're talking about roster cloggers like Josh Kelly and, and AJ Dillon. Yeah, no, absolutely. Gentlemen across the nation, I have an urgent message for you because Manscaped is back and they are sponsoring this video. The brand that took your balls to space is now taking you into the ultrasphere with the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, a new cutting edge design, next generation, dual skin safe blade heads for different shaves. It's pretty much a rocket ship to the modern body grooming era. Join the 9 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped, including myself, including Danny, by going to manscaped.com using the promo code BUSH for 20% off plus free shipping. That will get you a great deal to take care of your family jewels. Every man knows how scary and how messy it can be to shave using the traditional methods. I'm telling you, get with the times. I am lucky to be one of the few guys selected to try out the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, and I can tell you it is a game changer. Their fifth generation trimmer features two next gen interchangeable skin safe blade heads, a standard trimmer for taking a little off the top, as well as a new foil blade to go for the clean cut look. No more wet shaving, no more shaving cream no more messes this bad boy also features dual led spotlight so you can see what you're doing it's going to reduce the amount of nicks it's going to reduce the amount of uh, cuts that you get we're talking three length setting combos for whatever your desired length is as well as it being waterproof so you can use it in the shower it has a travel lock so if you're taking it on the go you won't get any dirty looks in the airport if it starts going on this right here is the cutting edge of pubes. Upgrade your ball trimmer and your life will follow. So go to manscaped.com, use the promo code BUSH to get 20% off plus free shipping on the new Lawnmower Ultra 5.0. Your balls have been through enough. It's time to go ultra with Manscaped. All right, so let's get into some of the leagues that you and I are actually in together. So we'll talk about the league dynamic and kind of like, um, you know, where our teams kind of match up. So let's start it off with a league where both of us are competing. So the Tone Setter Truthers League, we started this with our uh, highest tier Patreon members before um, we closed our Patreon down. Both of us are elite teams. Like I'm in yeah. first place right now. I'm not sure exactly where you're in right uh, now, but top we both have like top three teams in the league. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, big shout out. I was able to secure the demo over you a few weeks ago. Yes. Yeah. That is the only <laughs> loss on the season for me. And I lead the league in points for, so I still have the best team in my opinion, but um, mm -hmm. I made this trade a couple weeks ago because the Jonathan Taylor manager uh, realized that his team sucks and he needs to, uh, he needs to trade away Jonathan Taylor. So I traded him Marvin Mims, uh, my own 2024 first, my own 2024 second. And again, I went 13 and one last year and I'm currently in first place. So that is projected to be a late pick. And uh, I received Jonathan Taylor, Baker Mayfield, who's just kind of like a throw in quarterback and then a random, you know, fourth round pick as well. Yeah, I'm still salty about this because me and this guy were talking with Jonathan Taylor for like a good two months and all the offers I would get from him was like two, two first plus a piece or three first. And then I see this go through. I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? Like you couldn't have worked with me a little bit here. Like what's going on? So that's my own like personal bias, personal vendetta. Obviously it's an A plus move on your right. Like if I got any valuation, even within a 20% barrier of this, I would have accepted it, but you know, you can't pick and choose uh, what offers you get sometimes. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially this deal works itself out to be like a young receiver in Marvin Mims and then a, a late first and a late second for JT and Baker Mayfield. And I mean, JT, in my opinion, as a productive uh, team, and again, at this time, I made it September 20th. He was not on the field. We didn't know what was going to happen with Jonathan Taylor. So I was taking a risk going after Jonathan Taylor because he could have held out like the whole year or whatever. We didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but it's worked out, I would say, favorably so far because Jonathan Taylor signed a multi-year extension. He's back with the Indianapolis Colts, still waiting for the you know patented Jonathan Taylor game where he has like a monster performance, 80% of the snaps or whatever. And Richardson getting hurt doesn't really help my case here. But I will say like, I, I think the Jonathan Taylor that was healthy with a multi-year extension is borderline worth two first round picks. So for me to get him for this, I thought it was a good deal. Yeah, I wouldn't go like two ones, but at the same time, like he's definitely like worth a ton more than what you paid here. That's the story. Yep, for sure. So what, what kind of deals you got in the Tone Setters League? Yeah, so in the Tone Setters League, uh, the one that I have to show right now is uh, I was able to send on uh, September 21st, 2023, Jordan Addison in a late 2024 second, 
for Kyron Williams, Puka Nakua, and Jerome Ford. And this is the classic let me buy some points type of deal. The guy I made this with, he was a tanking team. Obviously, at this current point, people were unsure what exactly Puka Nakua was. And uh, I kind of just said, hey, listen, like if I lose on valuation at the end of the day, it's not bothering me. Because I went out there and I tried to make a move for a player that I think can accrue a lot of value with Puka Nakua. I was aggressively buying Puka Nakua going into week three of fantasy football. And if you guys don't remember, like this, there was a period of time where people were like, is Puka for real? Like, is he a top 20 dynasty asset? I would it's argue me, right I'm now. people. Yeah. Uh, I would argue right now, like at minimum, you have to have this guy in the top 15 of your dynasty ranking. So love that. Even if you're really high on Jordan Addison, Puka Nakua has got to be worth more in the open market. So I would honestly say that Jordan Addison, late 2024 second in exchange for Puka, Jerome Ford, who's giving me usable weeks, and Kyron Williams, who was an RB1 before he got hurt. Like, this was the perfect move for me to help me contend in a league that, like we kind of mentioned, we're both top three teams in. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Ford and Kyron Williams are both injured now, but at the time, and, and they gave you a number of good weeks before they got injured. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can make the argument right now that Jordan Addison and a late second for Puka Nakua is probably yeah. a fair deal straight up. Probably is. Probably yeah, is. Yeah, so... Uh, definitely a solid move there. It's aged pretty well for you so far. Hopefully Jerome Ford isn't out for too long and hopefully Kyron totally. Williams comes back for you. Um, I mean, maybe not hopefully because I'm competing against you in this league, but I will say uh, your team is looking pretty strong so far. So um, other leagues that we're in together, this was the real blockbuster. I want to talk about this one because uh, me and Ron Stewart, of course, you guys probably follow him on over on YouTube as well. We made an absolute heat seeker uh, last week. Man. So um, what we did was I so I, I'm like a complete tank job. My team is horrible. I had no good wide receivers. It's a best ball format, PPR, super flex, 12 team, all that good stuff. I sent him Bijan Robinson because my team was horrible last year too. And I got the one-on-one I get CJ Str or I sent away Bijan Robinson, CJ Stroud, Kyron Williams, and Josh Reynolds. And Josh Reynolds doesn't sound like anything, but in best ball, he actually gives you some usable weeks. I receive, and this was shortly after Justin Jefferson's injury, Justin Jefferson, Two 2020, 2024 picks, so his first and his second, and then his 2025 first and second as well. So, I mean, when I tweeted this out, everybody was like, you like raked him over the coals. Like, this is, you you absolutely hose this dude. How did you get two ones, two twos, and Justin Jefferson in this trade? CJ Stroud is worth a lot. B. John Robinson is worth a lot. Prior to this um, trade, Kyron Williams had not yet gotten injured as well, which has kind of hurt Ron a little bit. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this deal? I think this is a perfect move both ways, to be honest. Now, do I agree that you probably won for, uh, in a vacuum from a straight value standpoint? Yeah, sure. I do argue that. But at the same time, Ron's a very heavy contender in that league. He's up there with like me, Lucas, a couple other teams. Mosh, I think, is up there as well. Like there's like a complete tier where there's maybe four teams that are like truly, truly top tier contenders. Four guys who are like, you know, can do some damage, but probably aren't there. And then there's the tanking teams. Like I think you and Flett are the main tanking teams right now. Yeah. Um, and so, Andrew, I think is another and, tanking team as well. Uh, correct. Right. So it's pretty apparent. Like the league is based in tiers and Ron being the fact that he needs the points this year. He wants to try to compete. I don't mind making that move. However, from your standpoint, you've been trying to sell Bijan. You've been trying to sell your win now assets basically all year. And this is literally what you told me. Cause I offered you at the beginning of the year, Brees Hall in a future first round pick for Bijan. And he said, and you basically told me, you're like, I'm going to wait until like a Jefferson or a Chase or a true, true franchise asset gets hurt. And then I'm going to try to go after them. And I mean, kudos to you. You made it work out. Uh, obviously looking back now, you got Justin Jefferson and two extra ones to play with on a roster that you needed those picks with. Yeah, surprisingly, I'm three and three right now. But of course, you know, it is a points four system if you don't make the playoffs. And I'm definitely not going to. My team isn't going to keep overperforming like it has. The thing that I, I think is underrated about this deal, though, is that like Ron's team is old and but yeah. 2025 first and second might not end up being like the 109 to 112 like that. That could end up being a relatively early pick. But like, I mean, the way you slice this deal down, in my opinion, is that Justin Jefferson and Bijan cancel each other out. I think they're probably worth about the same. Yeah. Maybe you prefer Justin Jefferson slightly, but I think they're relatively equal assets. And it's yeah. basically two ones for CJ Stroud, two twos for Kyron Williams and Josh Reynolds, which I think is about. Yeah equivalent yeah. the only the thing that people are, are laser focused on is the fact that i got Justin jefferson and two ones um in exchange for some win now pieces which is like yeah. the dream scenario when you're tanking you want a guy like justin jefferson and picks yeah because i mean if you're doing the math there you basically got five ones of value and you got production off your team so of course it's an a plus move
Yeah, yeah. So I'm really that. This is definitely the, my favorite trade that I've done so far this year in terms of like what it's done for my fantasy roster. Because like th- there was zero chance I was competing in this league. Like I'm no. trying to tank, and I'm probably not even going to do a good good enough job of it to be honest. I'll probably end up with like the 102, the 103, 104 area. Hopefully, I can get closer to the Marvin Harrison range because my wide receiver core is horrible outside of Justin Jefferson. So if I can add Marvin Harrison to this team with my own 2024 first, you know, continue to build out my wide receiver core, my quarterbacks too. The other underrated part of this team is that I give up CJ Stroud. I still have Patrick Mahomes, um, Brock Purdy, Sam Howell, Mac Jones, and Ryan Tannehill. So I already, like, I already had a really good quarterback core before I traded away um, CJ Stroud. Um, So yeah, I think this was a pretty solid move. Yeah, no, I I like the move from your perspective, like mentioned. Uh, I think the next uh, league that we can go in that we're both in together is going to be from Debbie Disciples. We both made two interesting moves and both with kind of the same rationale that we're trying to get rid of some points on our team. So I'll go through mine right now. I'm a clear tanky team in this league. My only NFL quarterback on my roster is Anthony Richardson. And like Will Levis is a backup, but like he hasn't entered my lineup. But basically the only starting NFL quarterback on my roster is Anthony Richardson, who's obviously on IR. I have Drake May in the system. I have a very strong Debbie pool. So it's clear to clear to me that my winning window is more so once these guys come up, like Keon Coleman, uh, Devin Neal, uh, Trey Benson. Like I have a lot of really good names. So I basically used that and tried to sell some immediate production. End up giving up Brandon Ayuk, DeAndre Swift, and Alexander Madison in exchange for Drake London. Carnell Tate, who's a young freshman wide receiver at OSU, who I'm really a fan of. I think he could be a first round draft pick in a couple years and a 2024 Debbie third round pick. Uh, Debbie third versus Madison, whatever. I don't need Madison. He get a free de- uh, dart throw at a young high schooler coming up. Sure. And then these other two, what it boils down to is uh, Brandon Ayuk and DeAndre Swift versus Drake London and Carnell Tate. Now, the exact valuation of this deal is hard to say because it really just depends on how high you are on Carnell Tate. For me, because I'm bought in on the talent there and bought in on the OSU program being able to develop him, I was willing to give up the point production in this package. Yeah, there's. I mean, this is so much more complex than a regular dynasty sure. trade because Carnell Tate is... I, I would say generally, I, I don't like this move because you're betting on a 2026 prospect, which sure. is like so much could happen between now and then that, you know, this could be like the next Justin Ross. This could be the next, you know what I mean? Like some guys that we think are great freshmen at big schools don't end up working out. I, I probably would have wanted more for Brandon Ayuk and DeAndre Swift in for terms sure. of like locked and loaded. I can bank this production. Maybe you go after a 2024 wide receiver prospect instead of a 2026 wide receiver prospect or whatever. If this was Drake London, Xavier Worthy in a Debbie third round pick, I'd probably like it a lot more. Yeah, that's fair. Now that, that just kind of shows how high I am on Tate. Like he's a, a true freshman wide receiver. That's basically pacing like Marvin Harrison Jr. True freshman numbers. And like everything we're hearing from him has been really good on that Ascension path. So Again, it's more volatile in Debbie because we can't really straight say with a straight face like this is exactly what's going to happen because it's so volatile. Like like you said, Cardinal Tate could go down the Justin Ross path or he can just wind up being, you know, a Jamar Chase level prospect. If he has a Marvin, I mean, Marvin Harrison would be the better comp because it literally plays on the same team. He could end up being like a Marvin Harrison prospect. Right. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's this is a complete like I want to watch this guy on Saturdays type of trade. Um, sure. So I'll give you that. But yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty solid if you love Carnell Tate. I personally yeah. like the IU can DeAndre Swift side, but for sure, um, it's not like an outrageous overpay or whatever, in my opinion, uh, in this same league. So, again, it is a Debbie league. We have six Debbie uh, players already. So there is an interesting wrinkle of that. I wanted to. So my team is like. I would say of all my dynasty teams, this is the one that's most caught in limbo, which I don't like. You know, we never really want to be there. We either want to be competing or we want to be, you know, tanking for a high pick. The problem is this is a Debbie league, right? So high pick. Yeah, there's a couple good Debbie prospects and, you know, dynasty prospects in 2024 that could help out my team. But it's not like I'm tanking for Caleb Williams. Like Caleb Williams is rostered. Like Drake May is rostered. Marvin Harrison is rostered. All of these guys, for the most part, other than like Michael Penix and Romo Dunze are rostered. So. I sell off Saquon Barkley and DJ Moore. And of course, this was right after DJ Moore's monster 53 point performance or whatever. And I get Amon Ross St. Brown. So the reason I made this move mainly was to get Saquon Barkley off my team because I don't think I'm going to be ready to compete this year. My team has you know, suffered some injuries. It hasn't really performed to the highest level. I'm What I'm trying to do, because all of my Debbie prospects are 2024 eligible players, is, kind to, is trying to like one year punt. Right now. So I have Malik Neighbors, Emeka Egbuka, 
um, a couple quarterbacks like Shadur Sanders, Jackson Dart, and KJ Jefferson, and Jatavian Sanders, the tight end from Texas. That's what's in my Devi pool right now. So what I'm trying to do basically is one year punt my team. And if I'm doing that, I don't really want Saquon Barkley. My receiver core is the stupidest thing that you'll ever see After in mine. a dynasty league. Amon Ross St. Brown, uh, Chris Olave, like I said, Malik Neighbors and Emeka Ibuka in the system. My depth is really strong. Christian Kirk, Chris Godwin, Elijah Moore, a bunch of guys like that. And this team is is ready to compete in 2024 if things break the right way. The only problem is like my running back core is going to be a little bit questionable. I'm probably going to need to use some Debbie picks on some running backs uh, and maybe trade some Debbie picks for some running back production if I want to. I just think the way I made the, the reason I made this trade was to set myself up better than the middling roster that I had before this trade. Yeah, no, it's funny, of course, that the FSE lads end up with probably the two best receiver cores like we've ever seen, to be frank. Like that, like it, it's actually insane how good our Debbie receivers are. But uh, yeah, I, I love the process here. Like you said, rid some RB points. You know that your winning re- windows most likely when guys like neighbors and stuff are going to come up. So I think, you know, process wise, it's a good move. And realistically, it sets you up further. So there's no real further comment. Yeah, for sure. So um, I think, is that it for you on trades? I have one uh, more, I think. Here. I have I have a couple more. So uh, there's two in particular, both of uh, them being leagues that we're actually in together. Uh, the first one I'll go through is from, from No Flockin, 12-team PPR, six-point passing touchdown, 0.25 tight end premium league. I'm a contending team, was able to shift Hunter Henry, Jerry Judy, DeAndre Swift, my own 2025 first and third. And I was able to receive Puka Nakua, Debo Samuel, Marquise Brown, and Khalil Herbert. And the context of this deal is that I already have Christian McCaffrey. I already have Joe Mixon as my main running backs. So obviously it hurts losing DeAndre Swift, but I still have a couple running backs I'm comfortable with. And uh, this was a team that because we could start so many wide receivers on a week-to-week basis, I wanted to be extremely strong there. So overall, I wanted an- another Puka Nakua share. Bought low on Debo Samuel because he was kind of inconsistent to start the year. And Marquise Brown, honestly, is just kind of a throw. And he's like, do you want Marquise Brown? Do you want Terry McLaurin? I tried to go for Terry, but he's like, no, I, I want to keep Terry because I'm a Commanders fan. So I end up accepting Marquise Brown and he threw in Herbert as a bonus. Yeah, I mean, you could make the argument right now that Marquise Brown is worth a lot more than Jerry Judy. So, I mean, yeah. definitely worked out for you there. Um, I, like, yeah, Puka Nakua is the best asset in this deal. And Honestly, Debo Samuel and DeAndre Swift are probably close to like the next best assets, maybe the yeah. late first. But I mean, it's a late first. It's probably not super, super value uh, valuable. So yeah, I, I mean, I like your your uh, trading you know methodology in this one. You get a couple of productive pieces. You give up DeAndre Swift and some other things, and a late first is not really going to hurt you too much. So I actually made uh, a move in this no flock and league as well. So I'll just quickly go over that since we're getting a little bit long on this video. Um, the ma- uh, the move that I ended up making or the two moves that I ended up making was I sold off DJ Moore right before the monster game. So this time I didn't actually have the benefit of selling high on him. And I received Elijah Moore, a mid to late second and a fourth. So I would say, I mean... Not a great move, especially considering DJ Moore's blow up game. I definitely could have gotten more for him, pun intended. But uh, I will say, like, I, I don't think this is a horrible move at face no. value. No, not a horrible move. Uh, it, again, it, it does also uh, kind of suck that Elijah Moore hasn't taken the step thus far. Again, there's obviously some context there, but you would like to see a little bit more from them at this point in his career. I think you just kind of got uh, got stuck at a bad time. Again, the process of downgrade at wide receiver, picking up a pick. Uh, when you're not like a, a top end contender is always a good process. But at the same time, this is one of the instances where it kind of like flew back on you, if you will. Yeah, I think it'll correct itself over the next Agreed. couple of weeks. Like, I don't think DJ Moore is going to be a league winning wide receiver. And I'm literally tanking in this league. Like yeah. I'm full out tanking. So I, I don't really have any use for his production to begin with. He's a, he's not old, but he's, you know, he's like right teetering on that edge of like, do you want to rebuild around this guy or not? Um, the other move that I ended up making in this uh, in this league was a week before this, like right as the season was starting, I sold Tony Pollard for Nico Collins in a 2024 first. Now, I all I needed really for this deal was a random first for Tony Pollard. That's all I was really looking for. Nico Collins was kind of a throw in, to be honest, in this deal. And the guy has since ascended really into like a top 24 dynasty wide receiver. So I would say this one has aged pretty well. What do you think the value, like if there is a value discrepancy, what do you think it is between Tony Pollard and Nico Collins right now? I'd say probably Tony Pollard in a early two to like Nico Collins in a late two. Like they're probably pretty close in value is how I would rank them. So, I mean, like basically what I was trying to say is like, I would like Nico Collins versus Pollard is about equal. 
so you pocketed a 2025 one is basically what I'm getting to. Yeah, basically. And this is a league that's really challenging to get first round Very. Picks out of people. Like everybody, like their 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 sphincters tighten up the second you mention a first round pick in a trade because they're all, you know, followers. Like I'm sure a lot of you guys listening to this are in this league. So yeah, it's very difficult to rebuild in an atmosphere like this because people aren't just giving away 2024 and 2025 ones willy nilly. They want, you know, really good productive pieces in return for it. So it makes it kind of challenging to rebuild. Um, but I think you have one more trade and then we could probably yeah. wrap this up. If you guys notice, I'm leaning back right now. I literally have a solar eclipse in my side window. So, um, if you've made it to this point in the video, just comment down below solar eclipse. Yeah. We're, 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 we're kind of a little bit unorganized right now, but at the end of the day, we're having some fun with this video. So hopefully you just enjoy and, you know, have a coffee and relax. But this final deal, uh, 12 team PPR competing team, this team, like trying to poke holes in it is really tough. Like this is the FSC listener league. I've been building this team after the last few years. It's dominant. Like it's just Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, Sean Watson, quarterback, stacked running back core, stacked receiver core headline by Chase. Like there's no holes on this roster. So although we're, we're going to pick away uh, maybe a couple moves I probably even lost, I still have a, an insane team. So this first move, this is why timing in Dynasty is everything. I made this move literally the week before Devon A. Chain went off. The week that he played like 8% of the snaps, got a couple touches, he's looking like every you know early second round running back that you, you take in your Dynasty rookie drafts. So I ended up moving. Uh, this more so was a move motivated by the fact that I really wanted Puka Nakua. So I looked at it like, okay, Kyron versus Devon A. Chain. At that current point, their valuations were pretty similar. So then I moved Judy in a late second for Nakua, which I thought was reasonable. And obviously it's gotten even more reasonable. However, the only problem here is that Devon A. Chain is also going up tremendously in value. So if we're equating this, I would probably say if you took the late second off, because let's just say Puka and Devon A. Chain equaled, equaled each other Jerry Judy, honestly, I, I'm done with at this point. Like, what's his valuation in Dynasty? Is he a top 30 wide receiver? I don't think he is. I mean, had Kyron Williams not gotten injured and he was like continuously an RB2, high end RB2 the rest of the season, I think you could realistically make the argument that Kyron Williams is much more valuable than Jerry Judy in Dynasty. But like, knowing what we know now, they're probably about whatever. Yeah, probably about it. I mean, like, you could have lost this deal way harder. Way if you harder. didn't acquire Puka Nakua on the low, you know, prior to this like value insulation period that we've seen for him, um, this could have been really bad. Uh, yeah. Selling Devon A chain a week before his blow up. But yeah. thankfully, you got Puka Nakua a week, like a couple weeks before he solidified himself as like a top 12 dynasty receiver, if not even higher than that, potentially. And it's so funny looking back because uh, I wanted to buy the running back points, right? And he said, uh, well, Devon A. Chain's not really doing much. Kyron Williams and RB1, do you want that slight upgrade in your favor? And like looking back, that slight upgrade, like I wish I just didn't even get on the on the deal because it would have been Judy in the second for Puka. That would have been <laughs> insane. Yeah, that would have been the fleece of the century if that was the deal. Even if you had to throw in like another pick. Like, dude, you could have thrown yeah. in Judy a first and a second. It would have been the fleece of the century for Puka, Agreed. to be honest. Agreed. Uh, and then the second move, uh, Cam Akers, he's literally just like, would you throw on Cam Akers? And I said, sure. So basically the context of this deal is Walker for Metcalf, which I take Walker now looking back uh, from a valuation standpoint, knowing that DK is a 25 year old, 26 year old wide receiver. That's probably locked into wide receiver two status, but I have so many startable running backs on this team and not as many wide receivers that valuation side i didn't mind overpaying a little bit just to make sure i got a wide receiver obviously it hurts that dk metcalf hasn't taken the step that i probably thought he could have a few weeks ago but and then of course losing walker hurts but whatever you take chances yeah i, I i'm looking at what your team could have been in terms of like yeah. literal domination of the dynasty running back yeah. market because you could have had jameer gibbs devon a chain Brees and Hall. Kenneth Walker, who all three of which I and would Brees consider Hall. top six dynasty running backs, probably. So it's it's brutal that that you let go of Walker, I would say here. And I would say you definitely lost this trade. Just yeah. I mean, top six or seven dynasty running backs should be more valuable than top 20 dynasty watch, super. Yeah. No, I, I I agree with you fully. I think I do I did losses from an evaluation standpoint. Um it was just tricky, man. Try trying to make moves in this league right now. Like when people know that you have a dominant team. They do not want to trade with you unless you are losing the deal. Is what that's typically what happens in a lot yeah. of leagues, to be honest. And I mean, like I've made trades in this league as well. None of them were like really that relevant. It was like I sold off um, Debo Samuel and Chris Godwin. I got like Jonathan Mingo in a first round pick. I'm literally just trying to tank, so I need yeah. to get production off of my team. 
Um, but yeah, like this, this league is, we, you know, you're competing. I'm tanking. You were tanking two years ago and I was competing. That's I came so in second funny. place and fourth place. And then I had to tear it down and now you're competing. It's kind of funny that neither of us have been competing at the same time in this league. Yeah, no, for real. I, I mean, we got the couple that we are, which makes it even more fun. Like tone side or truth is going to come down to the wire and I'm here for every second of it. So, uh, you, you mentioned you're the top scoring team after this week, I'm going to pass you on points. Oh really? Okay. So that, yeah, I had a I had a pretty rough. I also had, had like a chase on buy and like a bunch of guys oh, on yeah. buy. So thankfully, a lot of my buy weeks are out of the way. But yeah, that is uh, the end of this video. If you guys made it to the end, you got some value from it. Leave a like down below. Subscribe to the channel if you guys are new around here. I don't imagine this is like our highest view getting video of all time, but I feel like you guys are really going to enjoy us talking about our own dynasty teams and talking about the market valuation, the trade strategy, and stuff uh, stuff that we were going through when we made these deals, because we're always talking about, you know, making in season trades can be a big time advantage for a rebuilder to get production off of your team for a contender to get good, you know, solid points on your team. And I think we kind of covered all aspects of what type of dynasty team you might have, whether it's a house money team, rebuilding team, contending team, whatever, we kind of touched on it to varying degrees in this video. For sure. And I mean, stay tuned for this off season too. Uh, I know you guys liked uh, when we did our own dynasty decisions, we'll be doing follow-ups on that as well. Talk, you know, recapping some of the moves we made in season, how the season ended up being, and then obviously going into the rookie draft, what can we expect? So uh, I just noticed you guys show a lot of support on those videos, even if they don't get the most views, like we'll get DMs, we'll get comments like, oh my God, I love you guys just being fully transparent on that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So again, like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed. Make sure to check out uh, flockfantasy.com. We have some cool stuff, especially Dynasty related, coming very soon. Uh, Dynasty trade value chart, Dynasty rankings manifesto has been you know recently updated. We'll probably do another sweeping update in a week or two. Um, definitely stay tuned for that. That has all the Dynasty trade values you could want to make sure you guys know you're getting good deals when you're trying to buy contending assets or if you're trying to sell off some of your contending assets, you know what to sell them for. Um, so definitely check that out. Link will be down below in the pinned comment for that as well as in the description. But with that being said, peace out and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.